Father, we come to worship you. May you accept our worship. And this is our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shalom, happy Sabbath. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. in the book of uh, Revelation, uh, chapter 5, verse 12. 
I'm reading from the New King James Version. Okay. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Amen. We would like, on behalf of the church, I would like to extend a warm welcome for everyone once more. And I would like to praise God for the wonderful quartet that we heard just now. It reminds me of my childhood, growing up, listening to all those King's Herald's quartet, for those of us who are growing in church, you know, and what a wonderful praise that we have heard from the quartet just now. Now, before we are going to explore the Word of God this Sabbath morning, shall we bow ahead? For word of prayer. Father God, we would like to ask that your spirit will allow us to find a gem that had been laid in your scripture together. Thank you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, I believe most of us know that today is the last Sabbath of 2018. And like many times when we are reaching at this moment in time, we like, we are, we are, we like to reflect upon all the things that had happened throughout the year. And if I can ask you a question this morning, what will be one thing that you can say about 2018? Now some probably will say, oh, it's a so-so year. Or for some, it's actually a celebration, for they're celebrating certain things that had happened in their life, probably certain things that had made them uh, remember all those things that had been in their life throughout the year of 2018. An Italian philosopher by the name of Cesare Pavese said once that we don't remember days, but we remember moments. And throughout the year of 2018, we probably have all these moments together with your family, with your friends, celebrating certain things that happens in your life. Probably it's a birthday that you remember. It was probably a special birthday of your child or, or, or your parents or your loved one this year. Or it's probably moments where you think about people that are living in somewhere else and they, you couldn't celebrate the birthday with them. But for some others, it's probably a year of tragedy. Just a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, Lion Air uh, suffered this crash that was a very sad moment for many, including myself, because like what I've shared with most of you, one of the passengers in this plane was my own friend. And when I heard the news about the crash of this plane, I was very sad. And I didn't realize it even worse in my feelings because one of my friends was actually literally inside this plane. But regardless of whatever happened throughout the year of 2018. For us Adventists, oftentimes we will relate whatever events that happened in that year to the last day events. A lot of preachers like to say we are one Sabbath closer to the second coming of Jesus. For every calamities and disaster that happens, we will always say, oh, this is the fulfillment of Jesus' word that the day will come nearer to the day when He's coming again. And you shall see signs after signs being fulfilled. And therefore, every time earthquake happens, <coughs> excuse me, even last week, when Krakatoa uh, in Indonesia erupted again, all my Adventist friends, their first reaction is very predictable. And I believe all of you know what it is. And that is, Jesus is coming soon. That is usually our typical response to many things that happen across the world. And I don't say there is something wrong with that. It's just because it is in our nature. When we are looking at events, we are always relating it to the events that is coming soon. And there is no other place that we should even look even deeper upon this time rather than to look upon the book of Revelation. So this Sabbath morning, we are going to explore a bit of this book, and we shall find a way to look upon this book and say that what it has to do with me today. And for many of us, as we look upon the book of Revelation, there are many things that we can learn from it. We can learn, of course, the, the 
distinctive message of Adventists, which is Revelation chapter 14, where we speak about the three angels' messages, the reason why we exist, and to proclaim these messages to the world out there. We are fascinated by the book of Revelation chapter 12, talking about the dragon and the woman. And we are fascinated by Revelation 13, where the power of the beast will come up and persecute God's people. And we are so looking forward for the day when the fulfillment of all these things is going to happen. And especially when the new Jerusalem is coming over and the world will be renewed. But today our focus will be in one particular thing that seems to be consistently exist, exist throughout all these details that we have seen in the book of Revelation. And if we want to study the whole book, we definitely have no time. But there is one thing that I notice continually to occur throughout the whole book. And that is the statement in the book of Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 to 10. Now, we had taken, uh, just like what had been read just now, let us read it again. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense and which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to by God, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, there is one detail that you may notice throughout the whole book of Revelation, and this detail is upon a specific name being mentioned again and again and again throughout the whole book of Revelation. And that name is the word, the Lamb. This statement or this word, the Lamb, is so important that actually the word Lamb was mentioned 29 times throughout the whole book of Revelation. It's mentioned more than the word three angels. It's mentioned more than the word 144,000. It's even more being mentioned more than the word 666. And many times we give our attention to the word three angels, 144,000, 666. And yet, the word the Lamb seems to be rarely being mentioned in many of our prophetic interpretation of the book. But actually, the word the Lamb is the word that being mentioned even more than any of these words that we like to discuss in the book of Revelation. And not only that the word the Lamb being mentioned 29 times, the word is also being mentioned always related to worship, which is actually the main theme of the book of Revelation. If you look, as you look and you study the book of Revelation, of Revelation for those of us who are very familiar with this book, you know that the book of Revelation is simply a call of worship, whether you're going to worship the true God or are you going to make a decision to worship the beast and its image. And as the in, 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 in the center of all this worship conflict, whether you're going to choose to worship the true God or a false God, the word the Lamb remains as an important part of every part of that message of worship. And the second theme that is related to this word, the Lamb, is the word judgment, in which the Lamb will continue to be the judge, to make decision, to decide what will happen to the people of the world in the day of judgment, both in the past, in the present, and in the future. And so this word, the Lamb, is so important, but oftentimes we didn't take a closer look upon the word, the Lamb. And to put in more details this morning, actually from the first chapter of Revelation to the end on chapter 21 as he comes again, the word the Lamb remains as a consistent, uh, present word that is always part of every significant event in the book of Revelation. He was mentioned first in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 as he was the one who gave freedom to sin through his blood then he is the one worthy to be worshipped, the one that we have read just now. And he is the one going to execute judgment of Revelation 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 16. And he is the one that will clean all the saints 
of their robe through his blood. And he was the one that will also become the shepherd on verse 7. And he, he will be the one that will defeat the dragon on Revelation 12. And on the book of Revelation chapter 14, in the chapter where we like to emphasize the message of the three angels, the word, the lamb, actually being mentioned three times. And for those of us who have studied Bible pretty well, you know repetition, especially when it's repeated three times, is an intentional emphasis. It means that the writer would like to emphasize, to tell us that the folk, please focus upon this word. Please focus your attention on the word, the lamb. And finally, at the ultimate description of the lamb, which was at the, at the wedding that he will have with the bride, the word, the lamb, being mentioned seven times. More than anywhere else, and as you know, seven is the number of perfection. That the ultimate fulfillment of salvation will happen during the wedding day and the word, the lamb, interestingly enough, being mentioned seven times. In other words, there must be something very, very important about this lamb. And we, like it or not, we have to look deeper into the writer of the book of Revelation. And we know that the writer of the book of Revelation is none other than John, the beloved disciples of Jesus. As he wrote the book of Revelation, in his mind, his focus was on the Lamb. This Lamb apparently is so important that he needs to re-emphasize the name again and again for 29 times. And so let us ask the question, why the Lamb is so important? For John. And for those of us who have studied the history of the books of the New Testament as well, many scholars suggested that actually the book of Revelation was written before the Gospel of John. For many of us, probably this is a new thing that you have learned today. But for many of us, we have known this for many, many times and many years ago. That actually the book of Revelation was written first then the Gospel of John was the last book written by Apostle John. And so as we look upon the Lamb in the book of Revelation, we cannot take it away from the Gospel that John wrote about Jesus. And interestingly enough, as all of you know, at the moment when Jesus was baptized, what did John say about Jesus? He mentioned, and it was written in the book of John, that John addressed Jesus with this statement, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As John remembered his vision in that island before he wrote the Gospel of John, he realized that the Lamb is so important that Jesus needs to be associated as the Lamb. And as all of us understand the book of Revelation and John, you will know that the Lamb referred to to a sacrificial lamb in the temple, showing that the lamb is the one that will make peace between human and God. That without any sacrifices in the temple, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that is Jesus, and Jesus alone is the source of hope, peace, and assurance of salvation. And so for John, the lamb of revelation is the same as the lamb of the gospel. And the attention of every one of us need to focus at the Lamb, this Jesus that had died for you and for me. And therefore, salvation can be found nowhere else other than in Jesus Christ, the one who had given his life for the salvation of humanity. And so today, the question that we need to ask ourselves, have you noticed this Lamb? Because from the book of Genesis, all the way to the book of Revelation, it is actually about the Lamb and the Lamb and the Lamb alone. It is all about Jesus. It is all about what He has done for us. It is all about His merit. It is all about salvation in Him. It's all about Christ and Christ alone. Because many times when it comes to the applicable part of our spiritual life, this lamb seems to be set aside and being removed and replaced by something else. Oftentimes when it comes 
to take a consideration of what is Christianity is all about, the Lamb seems to be not a significant person we need to explore. Now, this Sabbath morning, I would like to do a small exam. And I will ask this question. What was the theme of our sermon on the first quarter of year 2018 in this church? Anyone still remember? What was the, the theme that we have for this, uh, this year? Anyone would like to guess? Okay. Uh, second one. What is the second quarter theme? What is the third one? Now, I assume your silence means you fully believe that you have the correct answer. But let me give you a short review upon what had been discussed and what had been explored in our church throughout this year. On quarter one, we were discussing about we are one church, that all of us are part of one body, that all of us gather together to congregate, but not only to congregate, but rather we call ourselves as what? People who believe in God. And on the second quarter, we are talking about the activity that the church is supposed to do. And that is what? To pray with one another and to pray throughout the whole journey of the church. And on the third quarter, we have the message that we're supposed to preach and to bring out to the people. And that is to worship the true God and to bring people in worshiping that true God. And so on this fourth quarter, as you look upon the whole theme from the first uh, moment in October until today, we are actually are trying to answer upon the question why we need to be as a church, why we need to pray, and why we need to worship. And the answer is actually very simple. But oftentimes, we have a very different answer to this question. Even though the answer upon this question is only Jesus and Jesus alone. The reason why we come and we call ourselves as Christians is it is because we are Christ followers. There is no Christ, there is no Christian. The reason why we call upon God and to proclaim the gospel, it is because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why we believe in what we believe, it is because Christ had given His life and He has given all that He can for the, for the sake of you and for the sake of me. But oftentimes, we have misleading motivation. Oftentimes, when we, I ask this question to many, many people around the church, for example, I ask, so why do you go to church? And many times, the answer is, oh, it's a routine. I go every week. That's what I do. That is what Christianity is all about. And some even give a very honest answer. They said, oh, it's because my parents forced me to come. Some people said, when I ask, why do you serve? Why do you give your time, your energy, your effort, your resources for God? Why? Why do you give that? And our answer will be, is, oh, if I don't give, uh, the church will close down. If I don't do anything, who will do? If I don't do something, what will happen? Our motivation is out of fear that the church will collapse if no one doing anything for the church. When we ask the question, why we give our tithe and offering, and the answer is very pragmatic, and I won't deny this answer that some of us give, and that is, oh, if I don't give, pastor, how will you survive the month? You know, because if I don't give, pastor will have no food on his table for that month, or the church will have no money to run the activities. When we ask the question, why we want to be a better person every day, and many times the answer will be, oh, because I feel guilty. If I don't do it, I have to do the right thing. The right thing is the way I have to do things in life. And when we ask the question, why we are preparing ourselves today for the end times? And many people said, because I just don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be burned for eternity. I don't want to suffer the pain of going against God. And when we ask the question, so who is the source of your strength when you are weak? Oh, I read this book. It's a very motivating book. And inside the book, it said, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this and that. And that is helping me every day to find a new meaning, to, do a, to become a better person and to give me encouragement when I'm weak. 
And when we are asking the question, who is able to make us better every day? And our answer will be, myself. I am responsible of doing what I'm supposed to do. And therefore, I am responsible for making myself better. And then when we ask ourselves, what is our ticket to heaven? And many times, subconsciously, we answer, it is our good deeds and virtuous work. But isn't that against the whole book of Revelation? Because the book of Revelation only mentions one thing to answer all these questions. And the answer is simple, the Lamb. And I would like to make a personal appeal this Sabbath morning. Probably we have to reverse the way, the way we think about our spirituality and give an answer this way. Why you want to go to church? Because of Jesus. Why you want to serve? Because of Jesus. Why you want to give your tithe and offering? Because of Jesus. Why you want to be a better person every day? Because of Jesus. Why you want to prepare yourself today for the end times? Because you want to see Jesus. Who is the source of your strength when you are weak? Jesus. Who is able to make you better every day? Jesus. And what is your ticket to heaven? Jesus. Because that is exactly what Revelation is trying to tell us. It is the Lamb and the Lamb alone that will give us a hope and assurance of the end times. Otherwise, the lambs will only be mentioned once throughout the whole book of Revelation. But the fact that it is the lamb and the lamb that has been giving his life for his world is the center of the book of Revelation. Therefore, in everything that we do, let us do it because of Jesus who had died for you and for me. Not because of a pragmatic reason, simply because of fear that this church will go down when nobody doing anything. Not because of because we just want to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. Not because we are so scared of the burning fire of hell that we are going to heaven simply because we want to avoid pain of hell. It is because Jesus and Jesus alone is the reason we exist. And there is no other reason we exist, we do what we do, other than because of our love, because of our commitment, because of what Jesus had done for you and for me. And that is the reason why we are doing what we are doing today. A song was written many, many years ago, and the title of this song is If Heaven Was Never Promised to Me. And the lyric goes this way. You may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain? Or to walk those mighty streets of gold and to hear the angels sing? Is it just to drink from the fountain that never shall run dry? Or just to live forever, ever, and ever in that sweet, sweet by and by? But if heaven never was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally, and listen to this. It's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, you came along and brought me to light. If there were never any streets of gold, neither a land where we'll never grow old, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. You've been my closest friend down through the years, and every time I cry, you dry my tears. It's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, you came along and brought me the light. Has it been the message of our heart that it's been worth just having Jesus in my life? Many times our motivation in believing what we believe in, it is because of personal gain. Jesus is just a ticket for happiness. Jesus is the answer for my pain. But Jesus can, should, and must go beyond our personal gain because He is Lord, Savior, and God. He is not a genie in the bottle that we, we will ask for blessing when we need one. He is not just a way so we can avoid pain of death and suffering and hell. Many times when we ask people around if there is if there is heaven but there is no Jesus in heaven, will you still go? And when we reverse, reverse the question, ask the question, if there is no, if there is Jesus but there is no 
heaven, will you still believe in Him? Because oftentimes the focus of us is so much on heaven, but not in Jesus. That even when Jesus is not in heaven, it's okay, as long as I'm not in hell. But that is not the message of the book of Revelation. The Bible, especially the book of Revelation, consistently putting our attention, bringing our mind, showing us the way that it is Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of everything that we do and the reason why we exist and to call ourselves as a Christian today. So I would like to invite all of us to reflect at the end of this year, what will be your message when people ask you about Jesus? Will, will we be able to testify and say that, yes, He had been faithful in my life and He will continue to be faithful and therefore I am who I am today simply because I have a Christ who had been my Savior and I have this blessed assurance in Him. Unless Jesus is the answer of our question, then there is nothing else that really matters in our spiritual connection with Him. The last question that I would like to ask us this Sabbath morning is that what Christ had done so much for you that you are a transformed man today. If a person who never heard about Jesus before will come to you and ask you the question, oh, why are you a Christian? What is your answer going to be? Many times we will give a very logical, rational answer to it. Oh, because I believe in the Bible, and the Bible is the truth. But we never mention who is that truth. Even though he himself said that, what? I'm the truth, the life, and the way. Many times we answer, oh, because we are practicing a holy life. We avoid ourselves from eating certain food, and that makes us healthier. But that is just a byproduct of knowing Jesus. But have we really put ourselves in saying, you know, I used to be this way, but then I met Jesus and He changed my life. I used to be a man that was very, very angry, but then I met Jesus, He transformed me and making me a better person. You know, I used to think that life is all about money, all about prosper prosperity, all about comfort. But then I met Jesus, and Jesus made me realize that there is a greater treasure that I can obtain, and that is Him and the salvation that came through Him. How is this message had been proclaimed by every one of us in our daily activities every day? Has the message of Jesus has become the center of our life that when people know us, they will hear about the Jesus that we believe and will come and say that, can you tell me more about your Jesus? I want to know more about your Jesus. He is so strong in your life. He's so influential in your life that it seems like he's so attractive. I want to know him more. Or rather, our life as a Christian had been so diluted by so many things. Jesus was not the main message that people know about us. But the message of the Bible is clear that it is the Lamb and the Lamb alone should be the message that will be proclaimed in our life day by day. So let us ask this question. After you come to this worship service this morning and we will go out and depart together from this place and you will meet the first stranger this morning and they suddenly have this conversation with you, will there be Jesus in any part of your conversation with them? Will there, will there be any part that you will say that, you know, I'm a Christian, and I know Jesus, and Jesus had been so powerful in my life. I want you to know about Him. And don't you know that He's coming very soon? Don't you know that the book of Daniel and Revelation are fulfilling all the promises that He had made in the book of Matthew, in the book of the Gospel, in the whole New Testament, that actually Jesus is trying to say, Hey, I'm coming very soon, and I want you to see me very soon. Has it been our passion to really proclaim this Lamb that had been slain for the rest of the world for the sake of the salvation of you and me? Because if not, then we have to ask the follow-up question. 
how has His grace transformed you? How He has become a person that has changed you the way you, had, you were in the past and the way you are today? What is His grace means for you? Because when we talk about grace, it seems like it's something that is so foreign. It's something that we don't really talk so much. But have you ever considered this question? How much that His grace that had been given to you, that you have become a transformed person simply because of that grace? I once a sinner, but now I'm saved by grace. One of the persons that I really admire in this life is this lady by the name of Mother Teresa. Now, many of us know about her story and her ministry. She is basically giving her entire life to serve the poor, the sick, the one that is being rejected by the society in India. And despite all the questions that came during the time when she passed away, there's one thing that everyone can agree, and that is that she has dedicated her life to serve the poor and the needy because of her love to Jesus. And so people ask her, oh, but I don't have the same passion like you, and I probably do not have the same strength like you do, living with the poor and giving your life to serve this group of people. And she said, oh, you don't have to be like me in order to serve Jesus. And this is her statement that was recorded. She said, uh, sorry if it's too small for some of us, but she said, the greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty. It is not only a poverty of loneliness, but also of spirituality. Yes, we have been blessed by many prosperity, by many things that we can call as prosperity. We are not lacking of food, and many times we're actually throwing food quite a lot. We are not lacking of money. Many of us have stable income each and every month. We are not running out of time because we are sick of certain things that actually can be cured when there is a facilities to help you. Because in Singapore, medical care is one of the top in the world. But as you look upon her statement, she said, what? There is this deep poverty among us who are living in a first world country, and that is the poverty of love. The poverty that can go deep without being noticed. The poverty of loneliness, the poverty of being alone, the poverty of not being loved simply because of who you are. Sometimes when I share and I talk to some of the students, and they said, oh, I don't feel loved. And I said, why you don't feel loved? Because the basis of my love in my family is based upon the number that I show in my exam paper. And I felt very sad that in order for you to receive love, it's all measured by the number of your score in your exam paper. And many, child, many children are suffering from lack of love simply because they're measured by the number of their paper exam result. Many times we try to love people, but we have to measure their merit, their goodness, their kindness, their gift to us before we extend the love that God had given us the opportunity to have and to love them the way they're supposed to be loved. But if you look upon the reflection of life that had been shown by Jesus, is it possible that the greatest need of this world today, especially in a first world country like Singapore, is the opportunity to be loved 
the way Jesus had loved people in the past. Now, many weeks ago, I preached about my experience ministering to prostitutes during my time in seminary. And some people came with this genuine concern. I believe it's genuine concern. They said, oh, Pastor, I'm a bit uncomfortable when you talk about that ministry to prostitutes. You're a pastor, you know. You're not supposed to go to those areas and minister to them. So I said, good, because I cannot. Can you do it? Can you go? Don't you think that they need to hear the message as well? Don't you think that they need to hear that there is God who loves them and who is willing to minister and accept them the way they are and extend the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ that had been given freely to everyone? And to be honest with all of us, many times I feel the most comfortable is when I'm in those places, not because of the attraction, all right, but because I felt there, I learned how it feels to be a sinner. And to realize that actually you are one of them. You may not practice the life that they do. You may not life, believe in the lifestyle that they do. But then when you're getting more and closer and closer to them, you realize that you are as sinner as they are sinners. Sometimes when we are spending our time too much in church, we are mingling with the same like us. All of us are saints. We forgot that there are many people out there who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not trying to say that tonight onwards, I will start to see every one of us start to join nightclubs and everything. Please don't do that. And I hope that none of, none of the youth will quote it. Pastor Bai said, can what? No, 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 that's not the message. But the message is, have you opened your heart big enough to see that there are many people around you that is in need to know Jesus Christ? that they are totally unaware that there is this Savior that had died for them 2,000 years ago and that they are still living in the life that they are living in, not knowing that they, there is a Savior that is willing to love them the way they are. It is your duty and it is our duty together to bring this message of the love of Jesus to the people around us. Because if Jesus is not influential enough to motivate us as his follower, then perhaps we are not a Christian or we are a Christian for a wrong purpose. That we are giving ourselves and labeling ourselves as a Christian not because of Jesus, but because of something else. But if you look upon the book of Revelation once again, who is the man that being mentioned there? The Lamb. And shall we proclaim the Lamb again and again until that Lamb will come and bring us all together and bring us to the place where we'll be with Him forever and ever. I pray that next year, when someone else, someone else asks you this question, why you go to church? I hope that none of us will answer this question the way we have answered it probably this Sabbath. And that is because it's a routine or my parents forced me. But I'm hoping that we will answer by saying that it's because of Jesus and because I love Him, I want to do my best for Him. And for the rest of the question will be the same answer that will come from us. Because I would like to encourage you to look upon this very interesting chapter in the book of Acts of the Apostle written by this lady by the name of Ellen White. In that chapter, she gave her insight upon the reason why John wrote the book of Revelation the way he wrote and the book of gospel, the gospel of John the way it was written. And the whole chapter was so beautiful, but I just want to quote a specific paragraph from it. It said this way, John did not teach that salvation was to be earned by obedience, but that obedience was the fruit of faith and love. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in the heart, our feelings, our thought, our action will be in harmony with the will of God. Many times we are trying so hard to try to correct the behavior of our fellow church member, thinking that by guilt-tripping them, by telling them what is right, by showing them, oh, you are wrong and this is right, we are bringing them to the Christ that had been preached by John. 
But apparently, according to John, that it's the love of God that dwells in the heart that will transform a person in his feelings, in their thought, and finally in their action. Because it is that love that had been given so much that will transform a person into a new man. Today, my final questions. I have been saying last question, last question, last question. But this will be the final one. And this question is not being asked to you. But I would like you to ask Jesus. Jesus, how much do you love me? Have you ever asked that question to God? Jesus, how much do you love me? What, why I'm so important in your eyes that you said that you love me so much that you give your life for me. How much do you love me? Do you love me more than the people in my church? Do you love me more than the pastor? Do you love me more than anyone in this world? If yes, how do I know? Please reveal it to me. Allow me to really experience your love so I can really know what it means to be your follower. Many times we ask all kinds of questions, but we don't ask God this question. We ask God, why God, all these problems come to me? We ask God, oh God, please more, give me more blessing next year. We ask God this and that. But have you ever asked God this question? How much do you love me? How much that do you really love me? That my life is so significant that you said in your word that you will die and you have died for me. I pray as we enter into the year 2019. And this is not my New Year Eve message, all right? Please come again on Monday. I will have the New Year message for all of us. But let us ask this question together this Sabbath morning. As we enter into the New Year, in few days' time. Jesus, how much do you love me? How much, how important I am for you that all this Christianity that I have learned so far is becoming something that is meaningful for me. Because when you realize the love that he has for you, when you start to restudy the scripture and realize the beauty of being loved by him, what extent of things that he will do for you, then you will realize the joy of being a Christian. The hope that we put in Jesus, the reason why we do what we do, the reason why we exist as a body of Christ, it's all come because of this question. And you said, that, oh, how... how how come I, I should ask this question? No. This is the question that every disciple of Jesus had experienced. From Peter who said that he will promise that he will die for Jesus. At the moment then when his faith was questioned, he denies him. Did Jesus condemn him? No. Jesus looked at him and Peter realized that love that Jesus had for him, it transformed his life. It is the same experience that Saul who, were, who was persecuting God's people, taking their life and imprisoning many of them. But then that, on that road, when he saw the light, and then he asked, who are you? And the, then the voice said that this is Jesus that you have been persecuting. And then he thought that his life going to end. And yet God gave him an opportunity to be forgiven. His sight was given. He realized this is how much that Jesus loves me. I've been busy killing his people, but yet he gave me an opportunity to be his apostle. This is the message of Christ. And unless we ask the question, how much do you love me? All other questions that we are asking as Christians will have no meaning. So today, I just would like to tell you one thing. Jesus is really in love to you and to me. But if you never know that, how can you tell others that you believe in Him? If you never know how much God will do for you, you never know how much He will go to the extent of love just to redeem you. How can you have love to redeem others that you think are sinners? 
If you never know the beauty of extending that grace that you do not deserve to receive, how can we extend the same grace to the people that we think need that grace? If we never ask this love question, we will never realize that in Him, through Him, and with Him, it is the hope of today and tomorrow until the day He is coming again. Shall we ask this question in our heart as we enter into the year 2019 together? And in His blessing, I bring this message. Amen. May the blessing of the Father given in grace that we all shall find salvation in Jesus Christ will be, uh, will be with us on the day, today, until the day He comes again. And may the power in our fellowship with the Holy Spirit will sustain us until that day. For we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.